Luke 16, 22 to 24. We'll do this together. One, two, three. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Lord, we ask you, help, these, help us to grasp what you're telling us and what it means for us when people die, when we die. And help us, Holy Spirit, to make the decisions and to live the right way we need to live now while we still have breath in our lungs, God. And help us to, to take what is spiritual and make it the priority in our lives, more real than the material. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the whole story that is being discussed or referred to in, the, in those uh, verses is that there was a rich man, and he is nameless in this chapter in this um, story. But he was clothed in purple, this is the whole story, and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, chasm, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This story gives us a very good indication of what it's like when we die before the Lord's second coming. We have two men who knew each other in two completely different conditions, two different lives. One's very rich and one's very poor and suffering. But notice how they both are associated with Abraham. This is very significant. They both call out to Abraham. They both know Abraham. And Abraham is critical because he's, also, he's the physical father of the Jewish people, but he's also the father of all those who believe in the Lord through faith. Jesus was very critical of the Pharisees, the Jewish Pharisees, who tried to religiously find their way to God. And they knew and memorized the Scripture, but they took and consumed things for themselves. And he often criticizes them for loving money. They loved mammon. Yet these were the Jewish leaders. And their whole religion was this outward, outward appearance of religiosity. And um, they did their best to strive to look religious. And they also called Abraham their father. And rightfully so. Physically he was their father. But they were not born again by the Spirit of God. And they did not know the Lord by faith. It was a lack of faith. Even though in obedience they did all kinds of things. They did their sacrifices. They, they gave money to the, to the temple. But they didn't do it with the right heart. And they didn't do it with faith. And in this distinction they failed to realize that what God was looking for is that you love someone else. 
that you care for the weak, you care for the poor, and that you give of yourself. You are a servant to other people. And that is what Jesus did. He came here, Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and yet He came humbly. He came as a servant. He came as a carpenter's son. He came without the luxuries that people are striving for. And he continued to rebuke them. And in this message again, he is rebuking the religious. He is rebuking those that are trying to get something for themselves materialistically, especially out of this world. Those that pray for a wealthy lifestyle. Those that pray for the material blessings. Those that are always seeking for their comfort and their own self and ignore the plight of the poor and the needy. It's one thing for God to bless you financially and thank the Lord several, a lot of us here are blessed that way. But it is another thing to live as a rich man, with a rich man's attitude, with a callousness towards the needs of others. It is our desire as Christians, if we are calling Abraham our father by faith, to live out as givers, as servants, as humble people, no matter how rich you are. I heard a story about J.C. Penney that he made a great wealth, but he lived in a very small house and he gave away all his money. Very cool. Jimmy Carter, I sent a, mess, a story out about him. Uh, I'm, this is not a political message, but Jimmy Carter lives in the house he built and it's valued at something like $167,000. It cost more in one day for one security guy to protect him, one security team to protect him than the value of his house that he lives in. Two bedroom house. This blew me away. I didn't know that about him. Very humble man. And uh, this is an example that cut, puts us in contrast to what we see of the, the, the flashy super apostles today that are on TV with multi-million dollar homes. And they just they try to justify it. Scripture does not justify this. Not for, not for a man of God. Now, if you have your own business and you earn that money, that's a different story. But if you're taking it out of ministry, I think there's a problem. In any event, what we don't want to emphasize is materialism. That prosperity gospel is poison. And its clear distinction is shown here. Because once I start living for an earthly prosperity, and that's what God's all about for me, I've missed the mark. I never want to be callous towards a human being. It's not that this man didn't know about God. He knew about God if he's calling Abraham father. I'm talking about the rich man. But he missed God in it. And we don't want to be in our final moment and miss God. We don't want to be the chaff that looks like wheat but has no godly fruit. Godly fruit will always produce for someone else. It will always bless someone else. It's not about your own needs. And the more we seek comfort in this world, and the less that we're willing to give up for others, the more we resemble the rich man and the less we resemble Lazarus. Lazarus' name is recorded in this passage, but not the rich man's. To me, that speaks about a Bible verse that tells us that our names are written on white stones. Our names are written in the book of life. Those that God knows, those that God chose, are written. The name is written. He knows your name. He knew Lazarus. And Lazarus had nothing to give. He suffered. But God knows how many talents He has given you. He gave Lazarus nothing. But Lazarus receives a reward. He gave the rich man everything. He's a, he's a five-talent guy or whatever, uh, maybe a 15-talent guy. He's got it all, but he gives nothing for the kingdom. And he goes to hell. But he's not... Let's clarify this. So now he dies and Lazarus, they both die. They both go into separate locations. But the place that the rich man goes is called Hades. And the other place where the other man is, is with 
Abraham, by Abraham's side. So now we have to review further scripture to define these things a little bit more. Hades is a Greek term. And it refers to, uh, it, it's, it, it comes into the New Testament at the time when the world has been Greekized. It's become Greek. It's been Greek. And uh, people speak Greek. And the language, uh, like it's like English today. Greek was all over the place that the educated people were speaking Greek and the Gentiles spoke Greek. So this word starts to come into the, there's a book that the rabbis wrote that's called the Septuagint, if I say that correctly. It's a Greek Old Testament, let me say that. The Jews wrote it in Greek because most people spoke Greek. So they, they, had, to, they had to come up with another version. It's like going from the King James to the ESV, you know. Let's give them something they actually understand. Okay. <laughs> so uh, they, they start to come up with the Greek vocabulary. And this is Jesus speaking. So he's speaking to people so they understand. The Greek uh, definition of Hades, um, it's an underworld. So if they said Hades back at this time, it's, it's something in the ground. Whenever we're talking about Hades or hell, it's, the Bible makes references to going down. It's never going up. It's always going down. So Hades is something that's buried or underneath. And it wouldn't surprise me if this holding place for the dead who are eventually going into the lake of fire is actually in the earth. It's possible. And that's the way it's described. Um, the other word hell is interchangeable for Hades. But the Old Testament in the Hebrew fashion would have been Sheol. So if you see Sheol and you see Hades, they mean the same thing. But it's been, in that sense, it's been contemporized to become Hades from Sheol. But they're all the same thing. Hell, Hades, Sheol. Um, and that is the place where this rich man had gone upon death. But notice that Lazarus, even though he's in a separate place, it is visible from Hades. The man can see. And in fact, he says it li he lifted up his eyes, the rich man, and he can see Lazarus standing next to Abraham. And the man can talk. He's talking to Abraham. He can see, he can talk, he has a thirst so he can consume something or he feels like he can consume something. He has some form of a body and our bodies are used so that we can be tactile, that we can, our senses are able to help us connect with what's going on around us. We can feel, we can see, we can hear. He can hear because he's talking to Abraham. So all of those senses are active upon death, even though his body may be in a different state somehow. Why is this important? You're not just going off into nothing. You're experiencing something upon death. And if you're not on the side with Abraham, and you're not on that side with Lazarus, you're in a place of torment. He says, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And why does he need water? Because as Jesus has described time after time in the Bible, it is a place of fire and torment. This is not yet the lake of fire, by the way. That happens after the final judgment. This is a holding place for the dead. And there's a holding place for the righteous, and there's a holding place for those that are not righteous. And they can see each other. Now, I don't know if Lazarus can see the rich man. That doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that. Because he's only talking to Abraham. And it's possible that Abraham was given the capacity to communicate with this guy, the rich guy, and Lazarus doesn't see that. It is possible. But for those that are in Hades, those that are in the place of torment, they can see what they missed. And I think that's the critical part of this. He had as much chance to have faith and to receive Jesus in the context of his day 
as Lazarus did. And now seeing that that man that he ignored every single day, he can see the man that he didn't love. He can see the man that he didn't care for. He spent, he's now spending his time in torment seeing what he did not get and also constantly being reminded of what he did not do. And if you'll, you'll bear this out, that it's not just your evil actions that you do, Notice that he, it didn't say he lived an unrighteous life. We have no idea. That's not the point of the story. It's what he did not do that he had an opportunity to do. It didn't point out that he was an adulterer. It didn't say he was a murderer. It says he just walked by without looking at the man in need. Christians, come on, this is an important point for us. Are we walking past the needs, uh, past the opportunities that God's putting here for us? That's all you have to do. That's the omission that landed this man in hell. It's part of his torment. And do you want to see this? You know, do, do we want people to disappear into Hades knowing that for eternity, or this time period that they're in this Hades, that they are aware of what their sin was, their sin of omission, the sins that they committed, the people they harmed or didn't even help. And to see what they could have had. Because he can see that Lazarus is comfortable. And I know, you notice how Abraham, he's not condemning of this guy. He's kind of nice to him. He's just explaining. He's not the judge. Jesus is the judge. And even Jesus says, your words will condemn you. Kind of what you do, what you say. How you receive the gospel. That's what's going to condemn you. Now he is the judge, so I, I, I'm sure there's a part to play with Jesus. But, but he's going to point back to the word. And he's going to point back and say, did you do this? That's his measurement. Jesus is impartial. He is just. And it's not a, it's not a wavering justice that is built upon the word. He said, did I not tell you? everything that we needed to hear, we don't know everything, but what we have needed to hear about our salvation has already been said. That's, we have what we need. And what do we do with what we know? I know God wants me to love Him and to love others. Starting point. He wants me to care for the poor. He wants me to have compassion on the sick. He wants me to give and be a good steward for the kingdom of whatever I have. That's my responsibility. And negligence and lack of concern are not justifiable. If I am lukewarm, he clearly says he will vomit me out of his mouth. And that Paul reminds us, as we spoke about today, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I think I need to do that. I think I need to take Peter's message from last Sunday and know that there is a requirement for the fear of the Lord. With this picture shows us that this loving God is also very serious and very clear cut. And that if we are not willing to receive His grace and respond to it and produce the fruit He tells us to do, there is the cutting away of the branches there is a severity for those that say, I am a believer, but have done nothing, that have not existed by faith, and that they are cast in to eternal darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This man was weeping and gnashing of teeth. He had no comfort. It's also questionable that there's any light there, because where God is is light. And the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, will, be, will have its light from the Son and the Father. There's no sun, no moon. When you're cast into hell, he's able to see Abraham, but somehow he's in a vacuum of darkness. There's, no, there's complete darkness. Can you imagine? Complete darkness, but you can feel the flames. And we know that there are worms that do not die, and they continue to eat away at the flesh. It's this constant little eating all over your body of worms eating your body. 
and the fire. It's continual pain, little pain, big pain. And, and then the, the agony of the emotions and the agony of, of what I could have done and what I could have had. And it can, it's on and on and on. But for Lazarus, we read that in, in the book of Revelation that he's in paradise. We read that there is no dying anymore. There's a good old song about that. There is no crying anymore. There is no sickness anymore. Revelation 21.4 He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Now this is the final state in the New Jerusalem. So I'm extrapolating that something similar to this or exactly like this is already occurring where Lazarus is. He's comforted. He's loved. He's in the presence of God. Now there's a thief on the cross who dies with Jesus. And two thieves. And one of them rejects and mocks the Lord. And the other one repents and says, Wow, you are the Son of God. And he, and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he says, ah, today you will be with me in paradise. So now we know this is before the rapture. This is before Jesus' second coming. All of these events are occurring. This is that place you go when you die now, waiting for the, the final judgment. Paradise And paradise, the root of that word is, it's actually Persian and it has to do with a garden. Today you will be with me in the garden. We're going back to where we started. Wherever Lazarus is, it is, the, and then there's a reference to the tree of life. You will eat of the tree of life in the garden. That tells us that has to be the same place that was like Adam's beginning. Because the tree of life was in the garden, the garden of Eden. And uh, God intentionally cast out Adam and Eve to be away from the garden of Eden. Away from the tree of life. Because he didn't want them to eat of that in their sinful condition before Christ could redeem them. They would be living forever as, as a fallen man. But what Jesus was saying is that same kind of a garden you're going back to with me today. Because of his faith, his Abraham faith in Jesus. There's also a reference uh, that Paul makes in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4. 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. I believe Paul's referring to himself here, but someone could disagree with me. Um, he just happens to know too much about this event for it not to be him. And he's trying to be as humble as he possibly can be. Uh, this experience, by the way, he kind of relates to uh, God also sending him a thorn in the flesh. So he, the Lord was telling him, be humble. So I believe that this is also related to that. So Paul, we probably have Paul here being called up into the third heaven. Now, again, before the second coming of Jesus. So, there is a place, and he was allowed to see it, but he's not allowed to talk about it. He heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. A lot of details God withholding from us about this paradise. We just know it's a place we want to go. It's a place of comfort. But it's so amazing that he's not allowed to talk about it. And uh, it also implies that there are, if you have a third heaven, you must have a first and a second heaven. If we extrapolate that out, first heaven would be what we see in the atmosphere around us. The second heaven is most likely the place that Satan occupies. 
If you'll remember that there uh, was an angel that had to respond to Daniel's prayers and he was fighting through the Prince of Persia to get to earth and he was detained until Michael came and helped him. It's like this battleground coming from the third heaven going through the second heaven and coming down here. But the third heaven is where God is. God bless you. And that's where Lazarus is. We have to understand that. So then he is back in the paradise of God. And there is an inseparable quality except for Christ. Remember when Christ died, he took away the keys from Satan. He has access to the place of the dead. Christ can go bef between all of these places. And he did. The Bible says that while he was dead, he went into this holding area, this place of the dead. And, and we don't, it says he proclaimed, basically he proclaimed the gospel. His, he made a proclamation to dead people. Was he saying, you missed it. This is what you could have had. We don't know what he proclaimed exactly. But he says for those that died at the time of Noah, other than those eight that were saved. How many people are going to be by the side of Abraham? And how many are going to be in this place of Hades? If we look at the ratio of eight being saved on the ark, because the ark is also a, a type of Jesus during the time of the great flood, and all those that didn't come into it, narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And only a few will find it. There are only a few Lazarus. That's what he's saying. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many will find that. There are many more rich men going to hell than the few poor Lazarus going into paradise. And that must be why Paul says that he continues to beat his body and make it his slave. That he works out his own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is not to be taken for granted. We don't have an appreciation. If we don't are mindful of this coming day when we die and we are you're instantly separated from your current body. If you're not mindful and living for this, taking it seriously. It says work out. Do something. You have to do something. It is not just to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. That will not get you into heaven. He makes that very clear. This is an active process that we've been called into. And to take it so seriously that while we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, we're also mindful that there are other people that are headed, most people are headed to Hades and then the lake of fire. If I'm motivated, if I have faith enough to believe this message, I should be moved with compassion and earnestness to also reach out to the people in my life and share the gospel with them. And to make it real for them. And to live like I believe it's real. That, as it says in the book of James, there's a distinction of the kinds of faith. And he says, will this kind of faith save you? If you don't do something, your faith is dead. It is not alive. It has no power. The faith that you have has to have a measure of strength to it that activates the Holy Spirit on the resurrection. It has to have some power in it, not just a nebulous concept about God. And I think I'm saved and I'm going to church and I'm doing this, but I don't have any serious earnestness. There's no quality to it. And it doesn't cause me to act in a different way. I am the same as I was before. I said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Nothing has to change. I don't need to change. I'm under grace. That's not true. It is not true. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 10, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we will walk by faith. 
That's the kind of faith that will save you. You walk by it. It is your destination. You're walking to paradise if you stay on the road, if you keep walking, not by sight. And we don't allow the sores on our body and the poverty in our lives to dissuade us from that faith. Lazarus must have kept his faith. He overcame. He didn't allow the circumstances, the earthly circumstances, to diminish his faith. He died a poor, sick man. And yet we know that God will allow us to pray for the sick and they can be healed. But when they're not, you are walking by faith and not by sight. And Lazarus must have done that. He wasn't able to walk physically, but he was able to walk spiritually. Lazarus didn't walk. They put him there, hoping that this rich dude would drop a couple of coins in the bucket. And he just walked up and Lazarus couldn't walk. Physically, you don't need to have legs to walk. One time we prayed for a bodybuilder in Lima, and this guy was in a wheelchair. But he's, and he said, "Would you and Jennifer please pray for me?" And we prayed for him, and the power of God was shaking him. Man, he was. <laughs> everybody's shaken, and uh, Jennifer and I saw uh, a demon. We saw the same demon. We could describe it to each other and it was the exact same description. We cast that thing out of him and he was, he's in freedom and he's crying. And he said, while you guys were praying for me, I could see, and we could see the same thing. We could see him walking in heaven. And that, he said, I, I was walking. He said, I know when I'm going to heaven, I'm going to walk. There's no, he's not walking now. He can lift all the weights he wants. He's never going to uh, walk. But he had an element of faith that was given to him through the Holy Spirit to give him that vision of what he was going to be like when he died. And he's on my Facebook page. He's a very joyful guy. He's got a lot of faith and uh, he's actually, um, he won a lot of competitions and stuff and uh, he's got a girlfriend. He lives his life. <laughs> he lives his life with courage and that's what he, so we are always of good courage. It's not these circumstances that are temporary. We're living for eternity and we have a hope and a promise that everything will be made right. We will have a new body. <clears throat> Paul says, yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. That's why. Living for that moment, for the reality of that moment, for the time that we are be beside Abraham, and not regretting things, not regretting what we did not do for the Lord or others, And Paul says in Galatians 3, 7 to 9, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. See? That's why Abraham's critical. And that's why Lazarus was standing. Both Jewish men. Lazarus and the rich man were both Jewish. Both physically related to Abraham, but only one spiritually, and he was related to him by faith. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Abraham heard the gospel and believed, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And this is, when people get too far into becoming Jewish, it's not about Jewish being Jewish. It's not about whether you are biologically related to Jews or that you participate in Jewish rituals. They're, they're, people have blown this out of report. We need to understand the context of Judaism and know that we are to bless the Jews, to love the Jews. But we don't have to wear yarmulkes and... I mean, I blow the shofar because I found out there's power in blowing the shofar. And I like the menorah because it reminds me of the Holy Spirit. But we don't want to Judaize everything that we're doing. We don't need to live in Israel. Israel is here with us. <laughs> 
We are part of the kingdom of God. You don't have to do those things. And it becomes an idol and it becomes a stumbling block when I feel I need those things. You don't have to speak Hebrew to go to heaven. It's nice you can pick up a Bible and, you know, and get the original Hebrew meaning if you ever master it to that level. Uh, but then you also need to know Greek because the New Testament is written in Greek. It's not written in Hebrew. So do I need to become a Greek? Do I have to start wearing the, the things and the, going living to Athens and eating heroes every day? Oh, ah, there we go. Let's focus on what's important. Let's focus on the Spirit of God. Let's focus on His Word. Let's focus on obedience. Let's become Christ, whatever culture and whatever country we are in. And that we are living by faith. And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Justified. Justification means just as if I had never sinned. You are, and that is equivalent to faith. Faith is equivalent to justification and righteousness. Do you have faith? Faith will save you. Active faith will save you and put you by Abraham's side. And you are blessed in that. And notice that he didn't love Lazarus. The rich man didn't love him. Didn't even care about him. Just walked past him. That's what Christ is looking at. Not the size of your house, not the clothes that you wear, not the food that you eat. Here's a description in Job of Hades. Job 10, 21 to 22. Before I go and I shall not return to the land of darkness and deep shadow, the land of gloom like thick darkness, like deep shadow without any order, where light is as thick darkness. I meant to read, read that earlier. He could see what he lost. He could see Abraham. He could see Lazarus. But he's also in thick. Light is dark. There is no light. Everything is just dark, dark, dark. And all you feel is pain. Isaiah 7.11 Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shoal or high as heaven. Heaven is always up. Shoal and Hades is always down. Psalm 89, 47 to 48. Psalm 89, 47 to 48. Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Shoal? And the answer is... Jesus. And that's done by faith because we're never righteous enough on our own actions. The only thing getting us by Abraham's side is our faith in Jesus. And I'll end with this here. Hebrews 12, 1 to 5. Oh, sorry. Heaven is also you can take heaven and replace it with paradise. The Garden of Eden, paradise, heaven which is different from the new Jerusalem, new heaven and the new earth. But wherever Christ is, wherever God's presence is, that's where heaven is. There's a great song, uh, Your presence is heaven to me. That's actually exactly it. Um, we begin to experience that here. We begin to experience heaven here when we have the presence of God with us. Sometimes when we're worshiping, hopefully more times than not, we feel the presence of God and it's a small indication of what we're going to experience when we're in His presence permanently. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And that's why we can use terms like Father Abraham. 
Father God, Abba Father. We are sons and daughters of God if we continue in faith. We have relationship in a family of God and that's what we have to expect in the future. And we are not alone, we are not bastards, we are not cast off orphans. We have the hope of this great relationship with the Lord. But that's what he wants. Just like you don't want to marry a woman or a husband because they think you have a lot of money. You're not pursuing a relationship to get things, you're pursuing a person. You love that person, they love you. That's what you want. And that's what God wants. And that's why he keeps bringing it back. He keeps shaking us to get this junk out of us so that we're looking at relationship with him and a faithful relationship, a loving, trusting relationship and an eager expectation of more of that person, more of him and less of us. Lord Jesus, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you guide us and lead us Help us to have the endurance to go to the end. That we are prepared that whatever time and date that is for our last moment, whether we die now and sleep, or whether we're called up into the air to meet you, God, that we are resisting sin, that we are battling against the flesh on a daily basis. And that we make it our aim to please you. And that we are consciously aware every day, all the time, through the fear of God and the love of God, simultaneously bringing us into obedience, bringing us into an obedient, loving relationship with you. Willing submission that we want to submit and we understand. God, thank you for revealing to us the destinies of two men. And that there's two options. There is no third option. There is no purgatory. When we die, our fate is sealed. Thank you for that word to correct all the false Catholic teaching of purgatory. That we are either in Hades or paradise. There is no struggling in between. It is decided while we are alive. And our behavior now is what counts. Our decisions now count. And our faith now counts. It is our faith now that saves us in the future. It is our ongoing faith in which we walk to please you, God. Convict us of sin. Help us part from any false religion in us. And help us, God, so that we are bold enough to do what you require us to do. That we have courage. That we are faithful. That faith makes us faithful that makes us loyal and responsive to your word and to, to your calling on our lives, God. And Lord, we pray for the people in our lives, those that are not yet on the narrow path, that they are still in a broad path leading to destruction, that we are the light and the way because you are in us and we are obedient to you, that we draw them so that they can see we're walking in the right path. So that they can see that we're not in the broad way. But they notice the difference. And some will hate us and persecute us and others will follow. And God, but we are going to keep walking. We're going to follow that narrow path. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, God, that we don't get misguided, misdirected. I pray for those that are not here today. That have become distracted. Becoming engrossed with the world and I pray for them to come I pray for us all to operate under that spirit of repentance understanding and wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord Lord help us do the uncomfortable things to be obedient to you as Sherry testified that we all do that more and more. Help us, God, in repentance of sins. We're not good at this on our own. We're not good at being Christians on our own. We're not good at repentance on our own. So we ask you, God, help us. Help us, God. Give us the faith that we need. Help our unbelief. Grant us obedient hearts. And that we see you over all the distractions. 
I bless my brothers and sisters today, God, with the fullness of the faith required. And that we're all living for you, living to love you and to love others. And that we're not misled by material wealth and selfishness. That you will call us sons of Abraham and sons of God. In Jesus' name we pray.